here is my dream for the future. I would like to live in a world in which diseases are detected so early that they could be cured with simple interventions, increasing our lifespan and helping communities come out of poverty. I want to live in a world where we have the capacity to communicate directly with the plants and soil so that we can provide the exact nutrients they need for growing crops, eliminating our, our impact on the environment. I want to see a civilization that has a food system that's monitored so precisely that it produces zero waste so that every single calorie we put in to create these foods end up in our stomachs. These are not some dystopian Hollywood science fiction. All these dreams are possible with the use of frugal, low cost, yet high performance sensors, which would allow us to measure anything and everything at any time. In 2007, with the release of um, the original iPhone, iPhone 2G, there were approximately 10 million mobile sensors being shipped across the globe. By 2013, this number increased by three orders of magnitude, by 1,000 times, to 10 billion mobile sensors being shipped and deployed. By 2019, we were shipping around approximately 1 trillion mobile sensors. And we expect that by, 2020, by 2030, there will be 100 trillion mobile sensors being shipped and deployed across the globe. 100 trillion is 100 followed by 12 zeros. It's an enormous number. These increases in the price of, in the, in the numbers of uh, uh, mobile sensors have been driven and have been fueled by their price. For example, in 2007, the accelerometer that was used in the original iPhone costed approximately $1.50. Accelerometer is the sensor that allows your screen to flip when you turn it sideways, that, that counts your steps, and really it's one of these sensors that, make your, that makes your sensor, uh, that makes your um, smartphone smart. A significantly more advanced version of the sensor now costs only 25 cents. A six fold drop in price and substantial increase in performance and capability. Just over a time of uh, uh, 13 years. Of course, you might be asking yourself, well, why do I care? Why does this matter to me? The first answer is obvious. We will simply pay less for technology and the data generated using this technology will be cheaper. However, the second answer to this question is less obvious. As the sensors get cheaper and cheaper, we will start placing them in places where we thought, where we thought uh, possible. For example, in our beds, pillows, on animals, on our bicycles, infrastructure, you name it. And then we can collect data and gain insights into what's happening at an entirely new scale. In my group, our goal is to create high performance, yet state of the art, high performance, low cost, state of the art sensing technologies and push the envelope towards near zero cost sensing. We just want to do a lot more for a lot less so that we can eat, feel, and live better. The sensors we develop range from thread-like sensors that are sewn into everyday clothes to near zero cost printed sensors for monitoring food spoilage. We produce a variety of sensors to solve uh, different problems. However, our main goal is to create low cost sensors so that we can connect the world around us with machines to solve problems mainly around health, food, and sustainability. 
pre-COVID-19, you could just walk into a supermarket and pick up whatever food that you need. This was a dream come true for our civilization. Endless amounts of food and in a large uh, variety. As a civilization, we have sp spent enormous resources to make sure that we never go hungry. However, with COVID-19, it became obvious to everyone that this system is not a perfect system. It's fragile, it has many inefficiencies, and it produces a lot of waste. So the colorful scene that you see here is a bit of a misleading image. A third of all food that we produce gets wasted or lost across the globe. If we were to rank food waste in terms of the in terms of carbon carbon dioxide emissions, it would be the lar third largest uh, uh, third third largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world, after China and the U.S. In fact, 10% of all greenhouse gases are emitted due to food waste. There are many reasons behind why we produce so much food waste. However, one of the significant causes is the concept and the use of use-by dates. You have all seen use-by dates printed on packaging, especially in, in, in retail stores. What use-by use dates are, uh, uh, they are conservative estimates of how long or until when a product could be consumed safely. They are static. They do not change. For example, if you buy a, a product from a fridge in a store, you leave it on, 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 uh, on the counter at home, the static, the static date does not change. They are conservative. That means that there's a huge margin for error. In fact, 30% of food, all food that's been, are perfectly good to eat, which means they are completely wasted. Even though the use-by dates are conservative, there are still 1 million hospitalizations per year in the UK alone due to food poisoning. This results in at least 1.5 billion pounds in healthcare costs. Tens of thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands of people also, um, um, uh, also suffer long-term effects and several hundred people die from food poisoning. There's something we can do to radically change this. Paper sensors. This is probably the least sexy slide you will see, but paper sensors are inexpensive, yet surprisingly high performance printed gas sensors that are created using ordinary cellulose paper and some conductive ink. These sensors can monitor food spoilage and replace the static used by days with dynamic information. When food, such as fish, spoils, it generates gases due to microbial activity. Paper sensors allow detection of these gases and produce an electrical signal that enable non-destructive monitoring of spoilage in real time. The counterintuitive idea behind this technology is the following. If we take a piece of paper, let's say copy paper, although it feels and looks dry, it's, it is always wet. This is due to the, to the chemical properties of cellulose, the main constituent of, of paper. Cellulose absorbs moisture from the environment and creates a wet substrate that seems, uh, that appears to be dry. The implication of this is that without ever adding a drop of water to a piece of paper, we can actually do wet chemistry with it, which could be exploited to sense spoilage gases electrically. Paper sensors cost less than 2p per device. And this is for the laboratory prototypes. They could be made a lot cheaper at, at much higher volumes using industrial technologies. 
These sensors, once again, consist of nothing but conductive ink and cellulose paper. Of course, you might be thinking, well, if you have an electrical sensor that's inserted inside a packaging, you would need a reader, right? Well, yes and no. We were able to take the paper sensors and then hack them into a low-cost near-field communication tag. Near-field near communication tags are the same technology as, as, in, uh, as, in, the, as in the technology used in Oyster cards and contactless payment cards. And now you can actually just take your smartphone, tap it onto a tag, and determine whether a food item is good to eat or not. Last year, Reuters came to our lab and made the segment that I would like to share with you, describing the technology. When there's so much of it on show, the temptation to buy too much food is very real. And once it's gone past its sell-by date, it often ends up in one of these, even though it's actually safe to eat. Scientists in London think they have the answer to stop this happening. Using your smartphone, you'll soon be able to find out if the food in your fridge has gone off based on the gases coming out of it. I would never have thought of that we would go this far. Um, but now that everything works, it actually looks like uh, there's going to be a, a great impact. And we can bring it from the lab where it works really well to, um, to the industry and have retailers and customers use our technology. The paper-based electrical gas sensors have been developed here at Imperial College London. They're made by printing carbon electrodes onto cellulose paper. They contain what are called near-field communication tags and microchips. That means information on the gases it's detecting can be read by your mobile phone. The beauty of it, obviously, is the, the simplicity. Um, we use paper, everyday paper, and just print uh, an ink on it, and then we can measure gases. The sensors cost about two cents each to make. And the developers say supermarkets could be using them on food packaging within three years. The interesting thing about this, this, this video segment was that I was interviewed also quite a bit. However, I was not included at all in this segment. I guess I'm just not good looking enough for TV. Anyways, to make real impact, and to create the future that we dream, my laboratory has been heavily involved in translational activities. Leveraging the, leveraging the network of Imperial and together with my students, to date, I have co-founded four companies based on my research. One of these startups, Black Bear, is, is currently commercializing the spoiler sensing technology that I have described. They're a great team and they have already arranged pilots with, with large producers. Black Bear is focusing on integrating wireless spoiler sensors, both in disposable packaging, so this is mainly targeting uh, retailers and, and food producers, as well as reusable packaging, commonly used by, by consumers, such as the one uh, shown here, which is in the format of, of Tupperware. Of course, when we generate large amounts of seemingly unrelated data, privacy will be, a, will be a concern, and rightfully so. And we also hear a lot about how things can go wrong uh, in the news. However, when done right, if the industry and the policymakers, if they come together and agree, agree on the rules, we can make the information age powered by sensors safe and secure for everyone. If we're not careful, however, there is no limit to how, how, how bad things can go. So we might exercise caution as sensors start populating all around us. In the future, we will have low cost sensors everywhere, driving the information age. With ubiquitous sensing, we will make better decisions using the invisible patterns in the data. And we will make sense of the world around us at a fundamentally deeper level. These deeper insights 
will lead to dramatic improvements in our health, society, and environment, allowing us to create a more sustainable, resilient, and healthier future. However, as academics, we cannot do this alone. Please do come help us to turn these ideas into reality. We're always on the lookout for partners from the industry, academia, uh, government, non-government, and philanthropic organizations to work on these challenging problems. Of course, I'm not doing all this work myself. In fact, most of it is done by my students, by my team. So I would like to thank them. They do all the hard work, hard work and I generally just take the credit for it. There is something you can do today, maybe not all of you, but some of you, that could actually help reduce food waste. If you have an old fridge, such as the one shown here, this is my fridge, often there's a mysterious dial inside. And this dial has, a, uh, has, a, has numbers printed on it, ranging from zero to 10 or one to seven and so on. What this dial does is that it sets the temperature inside your fridge. However, it's not clear what the temperature is by looking at the numbers. Your goal is to make your fridge as cold as possible without freezing the things inside. When I read about this, that most fridges in, in, in the world are not kept, kept at, the, at, the, at the correct temperature, I actually placed a thermometer inside my fridge and measured the temperature and it was eight degrees. And it was, four, it was set to four. And then I dialed the number to one, it actually increased a little bit more. So only the temperature dropped to approximately four degrees when I set it to seven. So please go ahead. If you have an old fridge like mine, try to find the optimum temperature. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I will definitely make sure to check my fridge out. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm at home, so it's a perfect thing to do after this session. Um, and I hope the rest of the audience does as well to make sure that we don't produce even more food waste. So we've had a couple of questions from the audience both beforehand and now, so um, I'll get started on them. So um, the first one is with regards to the kind of um, food waste um, or food sensing products uh, from Black Bear, do you see, where do you see these going first? Is this something that we would use ourselves to monitor our own food or is it something that will be initiated by big supermarkets like Tesco? How would it work? Um, although, so Black Bear think, thinks that both of them could work. However, the accelerated route will likely be through food producers and potentially retailers because mm -hmm. they are really feeling the pain that they throw away food and it cuts into their, in, in cuts into their profits. So there is a, a massive incentive to, um, to fix, this, fix this problem. Of course, there's also an incentive for, for consumers to, to, to fix this problem as well. I mean, if we go, we go and, and, and buy products and then we don't consume and we just throw them away. Um, however, um, it just takes a bit of, it, it just takes a bit more time um, for, consumers, for consumers to get used to, get used to a new technology. So um, initially, Black Bear is likely going to try to uh, work with, with food producers and, and retailers, but and then as the technology matures, it will find also also its way to, 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 to consumers like you and I. Great. So we had a live question from the audience as well um, that asked, can the sensors be designed to pick up um, just, so let's see, just specific um, gases or is it, and because you talked about ammonia, is there anything else that they can be designed to pick up? Yeah, sure. Um, so we are working on, 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 on technologies at the moment uh, to increase the specificity of the, of the, of the sensors. And uh, recently, um, we have also been approached by the, by the US Army to, uh, to look into this. And um, for food waste applications, 
we don't really need too much specificity because all we really want is to see that in, in fact there is microbial activity and there is increased microbial activity. But for some other applications, for example, we, do apl we apply the same technology or similar technology for detecting kidney disease. There we need, we need more specificity. So, uh, and that's a technology that we're currently developing. And, and in fact, we applied for, for human testing, uh, um, which was gonna, which, which it was supposed to happen uh, uh, right before everything shut down. So it's not clear when that's going to uh, start again, but um, yes, it is possible to, to increase specificity with these sensors by, by adding chemical modifications to the to, to paper. Fantastic. And a quite, quite different question, but something that also it came in beforehand, uh, before the session. So in terms of the supply chain, how do you imagine that changing with these new um, low-cost sensors? Um, supply, so one of the things that we found out was that, for example, fish. Fish gets shipped around all over the world. And most customers think that if a product is shipped by plane, it's safer and it's, it's of higher freshness, therefore of higher quality. When we talked to the industry insiders, they said that the products, fish products that are shipped by large vessels tend to be fresher because, although it takes longer, because it's not allowed to place ice on cargo planes. So they're, they put small pouches to, to keep things cold and they don't last that long and so on. And then also at the airports, luggage, people's luggage, uh, uh, they are usually prioritized and cargo kind of comes next in line. So oftentimes uh, uh, the slower shipping resulted in better quality and less spoiled foods. However, we were told that they just couldn't convince, they just couldn't convince their customers. So these kind of sensors would um, really be the proof that in fact, a seemingly uh, a slower and, 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 um, and, and, and an even cheaper method may actually work uh, much better than a faster and more expensive uh, uh, way to ship, ship products around. So this is, um, this I thought was uh, uh, an interesting thing that I was told uh, a couple of months ago. And, and other than this, of course, you know, if we, if we monitor the chemistry of the things that are being shipped around, mm. again, if we look at the, the, if we look at fish, you know, not, if we take two different fish from, from the same sea, they will have different microbiomes, they will spoil differently, etc. So just maintaining temperature at a set uh, point is not enough. So we really need to, to, to monitor the chemistry. And if we monitor the chemistry, then we can start behaving differently and then reduce, then reduce waste. That's fantastic. So in essence, your, your sensors can help us almost reinvent the supply chain and how we currently ship our products and food across the world to not break exactly. them. Fantastic. I have um, a couple of further questions here. So one is about, what about disease? I've heard COVID has a specific smell. Yeah, we have we have not we have not looked into this yet. So uh, I I've, I've also heard that um, uh, dogs are being being used to to smell to smell out COVID. Um, we do we do work with dogs. We work with with sniffer dogs for for detecting explosives. Uh, um, however, we have not looked into detecting uh, uh, using sniffer dogs for for detecting diseases. Uh, in any case, so smelling out COVID is not something we have done. But your work still still engaged within COVID response at Imperial, right? Do you want to tell a little bit about that work? Sure. Um, so we have developed a, um, a sensing technology that miniaturizes the conventional method that's used for detecting COVID uh, uh, the, or, the, or the pathogen that, that causes COVID nineteen um, with a with a very small with a very small device. So. Um, the conventional way of detecting uh, SARS-CoV-2 is by taking a swab and then putting it inside a machine and really check for its presence. 
and this whole process is called uh, PCR. So we, this method involves detecting the, the, the genetic material from the, the virus itself. So when this crisis started emerging, we were just at the end of finishing a project funded by the Wellcome Trust for detecting infectious diseases in animals. And uh, um, with, with minor modifications, we started working on uh, applying the same technology or, or, or at least a, a repurposed version of it to, a, um, to, detecting, to detecting COVID. This is still uh, a work in progress. Uh, however, it's, it's very promising. Fantastic. We only have, I think we have one more question that we can take from the audience um, and then we'll, we're going to have to move on. But I, I will tell the audience again, please do ask questions because we might be able to answer more questions in the roundtable a bit later. So there is one question here that says, if the use by date passed by day one, what do you do? Do you eat it after smelling it? If the use by <laughs> date is... <laughs> Sorry? You don't have your sensors, of course. So it says that if the use by date yeah. passed by one day, what do yeah. you do? Do you eat yeah. after, after smelling it? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I can I can speak for myself. I always like I basically disregard the use by date unless it's past you know, like a couple of weeks. And yeah, I do I do tend to smell, and then um, and then if it smells okay, it's fine. And then if it's a meat product, um, I smell it after I cook it because, uh, so my father's a veterinarian and then he told me that if it's gone really bad, the smell will still be there after, after you cook it. And that's worked out okay for me until, until now. I mean, I, 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 especially vacuum sealed products and, 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 and products that have a modified atmosphere, um, they can last a really long time. So, um, for example, um, I buy yogurt um, and uh, I leave it in my office at room temperature, and it, I leave it out, you know, past couple of a couple of weeks even, use by date, and it was, it's been kind of okay until now. I've, I've never been sick, so however, I cannot recommend I cannot recommend this. I don't. I can't. We are can't not the much. health authorities. <laughs> I am not. I am not the health authority. I mean, you know, I do it, but uh, I cannot recommend that you do too. So in fact, actually, this brings us to a, a good point, which is probably in the, in the short term, we will not try to change with, with these technologies, we will not try to change the, the use by date completely. It would just come in as a complementary technology. Mm -hmm. And then as it gets proven more, because, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of legislation around use by date, tech, as, around use by date. So, um, it, so whatever we produce, it'll be very difficult to change completely the system that already exists. So we have to kind of grow into it slowly and slowly and build confidence. And then hopefully sooner or later uh, uh, with, with the massive advantages of these new, uh, new technologies, uh, we will start adopting them. I think when, when organizations see the kind of financials that they can get from this in terms of not throwing away food as well, they'll start, it's almost going back to Christina's discussion around the balance between um, conservation and profit and I guess it's the same thing here when you see the profit you can make or the um, the gain you can make by not throwing away this massive amount of food then um, then it becomes a bigger incentive that's that's very true I mean if so one thing that I have realized is that especially in terms of food if only one party is winning the technology will not get adopted yeah. everybody throughout the whole system almost uh, uh, has to win for a technology to get adopted and, and deployed and used and, and become a success. So in fact, it's just, it, it, it is very true what Christina said. I think that's a great end to this uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Fred. It's been really interesting.